Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this evening, Corporate Connect, featuring UOB Asset Management, as well as our audience from Facebook Live. This webinar is organized by SIAS and supported by SGX. We will kick off tonight's webinar with a presentation by Mr. Jeff Howey, market strategies from SGX on recent market highlights, followed by the corporate presentation by Mr. Edward Pei, Vice President, Intermediary Sales, and we will end off with a Q&A session. UOB Asset Management, a leading Asia-based asset manager with its headquarters in Singapore, as a wholly owned subsidiary of United Overseas Bank since 1986, UOB Asset Management has grown extensively across Asia with a presence in nine markets. Without further ado, can I invite Mr. Jeff Howie to present? Jeff, over to you. Thanks so much, Eileen. Okay, uh, good to go. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much to us for the kind invite. Really looking forward to it tonight and working with my good friend, Edward Pye from UOB Asset Management again, and talking about this exciting new ETF that we listed at the back end of last year. So, um, what we're here to talk about, uh, just quickly, uh, as per usual, quick educative overview in terms of what's been happening in our uh, Singapore stock market, just to bring everyone up to up to speed in terms of where we are right now. Uh, our Straits Times Index continues to be the strongest performing developed market in the year to date. Uh, it has generated a 5% total return in the year thus far uh, versus the S&P 500, which has seen a decline of 14% over the same period. Now, uh, our SDI, it's, uh, it, has, it is subject to two ETFs. One ETF uh, that we listed all, just over 20 years ago uh, has pretty much generated a 6% annualized total return since its inception in, the, in uh, April 2002. And we have another STI ETF that actually listed in February of 2009. Now, those two ETFs, um, have seen strong combined asset under management growth in recent years, particularly amongst the volatility of 2020. And uh, SDI, of course, has been with us since, uh, well, since the Straits Times Industrial Ordinary Index, which has a base of 100 on the 30th of December, 1966. So if you take the, the price of 100, annualize that all the way through to currently, um, I think that's pretty much an average annualized price return of 6% a year. So it's just a little bit of long-term history on the SDI, but for the moment, what's happening, as we said, is this, um, this SDI is, is, is outpacing the developed, uh, in all the developed indices across the world. It's because what we have is global equity markets really uh, more in an oscillating, non-trending mode. Um, you've seen uh, the bear trends, obviously, in, in the US indices. Um, but really, the markets are taking their cues from all the significant macro, geopolitical and COVID uh, progress. Geopolitical, uh, it marks three three months today since the Russian incursion into, into Ukraine. So this has all had a very uh, exacerbated impact on some of the inflation drivers that we came into the year with and uh, really um, provided a lot of trading opportunities for investors. Um, if you take the STI, for example, which is this, this blue line, this dark blue line in this chart here, um, since ending at 31.30 last year, the SDI has rallied up to 34.60 in mid-Feb. It's come back to 31.20 uh, in, in uh, around 31.30 in the first week of March, then returned back up to those 34.60 levels at the end of March before coming back to 3,200 at the moment. And these, this, this, um, these swings have seen the 30-day uh, annualized volatility basically edge higher to about 13% on average this year versus 11.5% last year. Now, the SDI's strongest performer this year is been uh, Semcorp Industries, which makes up uh, just only 0.8% of the SDI, so eight tenths of a percent of the SDI. But globally, utility stocks comprise between three to 4% of the value of global stocks. Um, Asia's largest utility play by market value, it's listed in China, China Yangtze Power. Uh, that's an operator of those big hydropower plants on the Yangtze River. It's declined 1% so far this year, and it's trimmed its total return since the end of 2018 to still 70%, 70%. 
Now, while the SDR, well, that stock, that uh, CYPC, has outpaced both regional and global utility benchmarks since the end of 2018, that duration has actually seen Singapore's biggest utility play, Semcorp Industries, double the returns of CYPC uh, with a 140% total return. So uh, in 2021, we saw Semcorp Industries report revenue uh, 7.8 billion Sing dollars uh, com compared to 5.4 billion in 2020, driven by improvements across all segments and the biggest contribution, obviously, conventional energy, which was 86% of the group's revenue for last year. The company is still pressing ahead with strategic transformation of its portfolio from brown to green energy, uh, and that has that objective for sustainable solutions to make up 70% of its net profit by 2025, which will be out from 20% in 2020. So what we're seeing in Singapore, in our stock market here, is pretty much what we've been seeing across the world. Now, the reason we haven't seen our benchmark really sell off like the FTSE developed index, the S&P 500, for instance, is because technology stocks make up 1.6% of the SDI, which is venture corporation, versus 22% of those big global benchmarks led by tech, which have led the declines. Um, for the first 20 weeks of this year, it's energy, agriculture, stocks in particular, have led the global stock market. Um, and that's, as we said, the supply constraints from the Ukraine crisis, exacerbating price gains in those commodities, which had obviously been previously driven by demand factors. Now, among Singapore's most actively 100 traded stocks this year, Rex, Geo Energy, RH Petrogas, Golden Energy and Resources, those four energy plays, upstream energy plays, two thermal coal, two oil and gas, have averaged 60% gains in the year to date following their average 200% total returns last year. So crude's trading at 110 US dollars a barrel. Um, that's 45% above its end of le year le level last year. While uh, May Indonesia thermal coal futures, which trade on SGX, are actually up 90% from their end of 2021 level. Um, so Rex International, I think it recorded revenue close to 160 million US dollars last year. That was a 240% increase year on year. Um, RH Petrogas had its net profit at 27 million US dollars. That was a very sharp reversal from a loss of $4.8 million back in 2020. And last year, Geo Energy Resources achieved record revenue as well, I think 640 million US dollars, um, which was more than double what it was in 2020. Golden Energy and Resources also delivered record revenue. So. Re the, the, the profit growth, revenue growth has been a strong driver of these stocks. Um, and then also on the agricultural side, crude palm oil producers have outpaced the region, golden agri resources, first resources, and Bumitami agri, which also rank among the top 100 stocks by turnover this year. Um, they've averaged 38% gains so far this year, following 31% gains last year. And you've got July CPO futures, currently trading more than 50% above their end of 2021 level. Um, Golden Agri Resources revenue for the full year last year crossed 10 billion US dollars. That, that was an all time high. And that was on the back of the strong CPO prices. First Resources also delivered record sales in 2021. Um, and stronger production last year also enabled Bumitama, Bumitama Agri to capitalize on those soaring prices and surpass the uh, Indonesia Ringgit 10 trillion revenue milestone um, with a record breaking profit. Um, so this month, the, the trio also reported their first quarter numbers. Bumitama Agri reported higher output and margins. Uh, Golden Agri re, um, reported a record March quarter. Interesting first resources, its net profit jumped by 700%, but that was driven by the stronger average selling prices um, with a uh, decline actually in sales volumes year on year. So, so that's, that's, I mean, this, I'm just trying to uh, draw out the good um, before we obviously focus a little bit more on yield, uh, which I know Edward, Ed, Edward will take us up on that. Uh, but I, I just wanted to draw out that these sec sectors are current, have been the sectors in play for the first 20, um, 20 weeks of this year. The third one is utilities and, and utilities uh, in Singapore have Semcorp Industries, as we said, the biggest stock. They've averaged 
a 3% total return this year. That's a defensive total 3% total return this year. That's for our five util five most traded utility plays. Um, that's, uh, what, what are they there? Um, Semcorp Industries, Keppel Infrastructure Trust, SICC Environment, China Everbite Water, and Union Gas Holdings. So mixed returns in the year to date from a 40% uh, total return for Semcorp Industries to a 17% decline to for Union Gas. So the two China plays, um, China Everbright Water is an environmental protection company focusing on water environment management and SIC, SIIC Environment Holdings is a leading uh, water treatment and environmental protect, protection company. Um, SIIC Environment, uh, basically its first quarter net profit attributable was uh, up close to 10%. Um, in 2021, uh, when you look at the, the, the utility plays in, here in Singapore, uh, Singapore made up 62% of Semcorp Industries revenue, 35% of Keppel Infrastructure Trust revenue, and 100% of Union Gas's revenue. So that, those, that trio, they have, they have all outpaced the SDI's total return of 19% since the end of 2018. Um, the respective total returns, as we said, are over 130% for Semcorp Industries, 46% for Keppel Infrastructure Trust, 240% for Union Gas Holdings, which last year Union Gas Holdings also graduated from the Catalyst Board to the main board. So um, I, I did want to just draw those those five stocks out and, and uh, bring them to your attention because some of them aren't amongst the most traded 50, 100 stocks and so forth, but nonetheless, they are our five most traded utility stocks and Union Gas Holdings, uh, it has declined 17% because it, it is uh, in a different part of the value chain of the oil, of the gas industry than the oil and gas explorers per se. So Union Gas's holdings, um, it's three main business segments, uh, liquefied uh, petroleum gas, so that's LPG, uh, natural gas and diesel. And in April, the group noted that the ongoing COVID-19 uh, endemic had continued to obviously disrupt supply chains as we know, but it was expected to worsen because of Ukraine um, crisis. And, and thus uh, the energy prices were leading, higher energy prices were basically leading to rising operational costs for the group. And uh, that's, so that's, that's giving you just a little bit of a, a taste of, of what, what's been happening. And at the sector level, the least performing sector all across the world is obviously technology. Um, yeah, what what's happened is is you've had you've had strong orders as we've seen so um it, with, with a couple of examples like aem for instance but a lot of 2022's orders were built into 2021's rally for the for the for the uh, tech stocks so the outlook for growth growth the relevance of inflation drivers to the sector particularly that the two key drivers of inflation are energy and supply chain bottlenecks that both directly impacts those companies operating in the technology sector um, that's 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 seen um, a lot of investors question whether that five-year cycle had come to an end, but global demand still has strength in high-performance computing and, of course, automobiles. Um, versus, I guess, with the trimming of global growth outlooks, a trimming of the consumer elements, that is, a trim, trimming of demand for smartphones, tablets, and PCs, and so forth, and of course, supply chain inventories are are, are a very important driver. But nonetheless, for for our first quarter. Our most traded, um, definitely re the most retail traded technology stock is AM Holdings that reported a record quarterly revenue of two, uh, more than 260 million Sing dollars for the quarter. Um, and that was the highest in the group's history, uh, up from $80 million a year ago. And it had raised its revenue guidance for the year as well to up between 700 and $750 million. So let me just, um, a couple more minutes just to, just to end up. So growth and inflation, uh, obviously, the two key mega macro drivers that really matter most to the market at the moment and do remain firmly in focus. Um, the Ukraine crisis has simultaneously weighed growth and lifted inflation, while the recurring um, endemic impacts have also tapered growth in China and Japan. So closer to home, we've got these reopenings in ASEAN supporting domestic and service driven growth. So we've seen a lot of hospitality reopening um, stocks and REITs in particular, 
see a soar, soaring turnover this year compared to last year with, with a lot more trading turnover, particularly in the REIT sector this year on the back of the reopening that we're seeing across the region. So just, just, just I mean, one stat that I looked at over the weekend, I, I, I went into the Bloomberg and looked at um, ASEAN's top 50 stocks by market value. They've averaged 6% total return so far this year. The top 50 about by value for Japan and China have respectively averaged 10% declines for Japan, 18% declines for China. So the reopening is a key theme. And look, as we saw back on, when was it? It was the 5th of May, 5th of May the reopening has seen uh, Singapore March retail sales print year on year growth well above expectations, all the while Changi continues to ramp up. So Fraser Hospitalities Trust has been the strongest performing APAC REIT in the year to date with SunTech REIT, CDL Hospitality Trust and Far East Hospitality Trust also ranking among the 10 strongest APAC REITs so far this year. On average, those four trusts, they average 4% yields and they're trading a 6% discount uh, to their end of 2019 book multiples. Um, and that's almost half the comparative discount to their end of 2019 levels observed for global REITs. Um, however, as we said, the outlook um, really depends on how much growth deceleration and increased inflation can, um, can overarch some of this reopening theme that we're seeing across the region um, and impact obviously hospitality's industry's key indicator, which is, which is of course rev par, that is revenue per available room. Um, so it's interesting that uh, we've got the global macro drivers, which is, as we said, the, the, the technology stocks on the downside because of the growth, but the inflation has lifted agriculture, utilities and energy stocks higher. Banks a little bit higher as well with the upward structural shift in the yield curves that drive the net interest margins for our trio of banks. So that's why um, banks have pretty much generated a total return in line with the SDI and supported the SDI and being comparatively defensive. And then of course, in Singapore and across ASEAN, we have this strong reopening theme, which has been really impacting the REITs. And well, the REITs, uh, it's a very big year for us this year. It's actually 20 years since 2002 um, that we've uh, grown this, 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 what is really Asia's largest REIT and property trust market. Uh, as of the end of April, I think the combined value of the S REIT sector stood at around 115 uh, billion Sing dollars. That represents 13% of the total market cap now of all stocks listed on SGX, as well as a quarter of the day to day turnover of the combined turnover of all the stocks. So, um, REITs, why they've been attractive to, to investors, they do have a track record for being defensive in nature and the 800 or so REITs that are listed across the world have performed comparatively well in terms of yield and volatility and net asset value over the past 10 years, which has spanned, as we say, all these broader market ups and downs, including interest rate cycles. And how we now move with this very important sector with the um, environmental, social and governance uh, demands of, of, of the next 10 years and so, is gonna be really exciting. Um, and I'm really uh, happy to hand this now over to Edward to hear more from him, uh, how uh, UOB asset management and iEdge uh, have come together to build this uh, this ETF, which I have to um, disclaim, I, I, I do own some units of. So I'll leave it over to you now, Edward. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Up next, uh, may I invite uh, Edward to do your proper presentation? Okay, Ken, thank you. All right, just let me share it again. Yep, I hope everyone's seeing the, uh, the full screen. Okay, yeah, thanks Jeff for the uh, great um, you know, handover. <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, the ESG thing that we have been talking about is actually becoming a mainstream as well. Um, and of course, you know, uh, in uh, a UOB asset management as well, uh, we drive sustainability by, of course, putting uh, ESG impact at the heart of our business. Um, sustainability has been a cost
opportunity in aiding the flow and the allocation of uh, investment capital towards sustainable opportunities and be active owners you know, of our own investments. And our vision is to become a leader in sustainability in Asia uh, to create long-term value uh, and positive impact for our stakeholder while, of course, enabling uh, sustainable investment accessible to, I mean, accessible for all. So that's why today, you know, uh, we're, I'm going to talk about, you know, Singaporeans and Singapore favorite asset, one of the asset favorite asset class REITs as well, and then how we actually go about, you know, getting uh, green into uh, REITs. So the next 20 minutes or so, uh, I will be articulating the case of, you know, why APEC REITs, uh, why the need for APEC REITs to be green, and how is this the investment opportunity for all of us uh, for a sustainable future. So um, these are some of the um, key features of this ETF. So this is a world first APEC uh, Green Real Estate Investment Trust ETF. Uh, now this is the index that we're tracking. It's actually developed by SGX as part of our SGX IH product suite uh, in collaboration with uh, UBAM as uh, Jeff has actually mentioned. And of course, um, our aim is to actually contribute to the greening of the real estate sector with a focus on Asia Pacific. Uh, we had an initial seeding from our parent company, UOB Group, and as well as uh, this uh, ETF actually aims for a quarterly distribution of up to 4% per annum, as well as you know, delivering both profit and purpose with a positive green impact. So I think, uh, let me just kind of move on to you know, why the case for REITs and sustainable REITs. Um, just a little recap on what REITs are. I guess many people, uh, many of you know here what REITs are, but uh, you know they are just typically a collective investment vehicle uh, where you know your money is actually pulled together with other investors' money to uh, invest in a, a portfolio of professionally managed real estate properties or assets. And uh, they can definitely prove a valuable addition to a traditional stock and bond uh, portfolio uh, in many ways as uh, you know, REITs can earn uh, both long-term uh, returns via um, appreciation as well as regular income through uh, dividend. Of course, the underlying asset actually provides you know, steady rental stream which flows through to investors as a regular income distribution. And dividends are generally prompt and consistent. Uh, you, know, you don't have to chase a tenant for rent like a fiscal property. Now, I think our strategy's focus is mainly on Asia Pacific, and I guess you know why Asia Pacific as an allocation is attractive and con uh, con uh, con convincing. I think one thing is that if you look in terms of demographic, if you focus into it, Asia Pacific um, is home to 4.4 billion on about 57 percent of the uh, global population. So the UN, you know, Department of uh, Economic and Social Affairs projected. By 2030, the urban population in Asia will be more than 2.5 billion. And by 2050, if you look at it over uh, at the end of the chart, is that you know it will cross the three uh, billion mark uh, compared to other regions. And of course, Asia, you know, has the highest growth potential. Now, now with this, you know, demographic growth, uh, what does that actually translate to? So. When we talk about urban areas, I think urban areas are generally, you know, associated with uh, greater product, uh, productivity uh, due to agglomeration economies. Uh, you have more opportunities, including, uh, you know, uh, in, in employment as well as higher quality of life, better education. And of course, with the rise in urban population, uh, we are already seeing a trend of growth uh, in working age adult across uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, Cushman and Wakefield is that they are actually a global commercial real estate service firm. Uh, it's Projecting that you know, this growth in uh, working age adults, um, you know, is translating to a demand for an additional you know 1.35 billion square feet of uh, office across Asia Pacific region uh, between 2020 to uh, 2030. So of course, needless to say, you know, this shows that Asia Pacific real estate is definitely set to grow rapidly. Now, if we couple the uh, demographic aspect and you know, switch the lenses to the investment opportunity of uh, why Asia Pacific REITs, it will uh, present itself a much more appealing case. So within equity, I think REITs are you know, looked upon favorably as an asset class. You know, of course, it's allow one to diversify beyond the standard um, sector location. Um, it, the, the risk profile differs greatly given that they are like an equity with bond-like features. And when we compare, you know, Asia Pacific grids to the broader Asia Pacific equity market, it outperform over the long term. Now, delivering an annualized return of uh, um, 
uh, versus um, a return of 4.97 uh, for the MSCI Asia Pacific. So, and in terms of yield, um, Asia Pacific REITs generate much better absolute yields uh, compared to uh, equities as well as government bond. So I think another thing is that, you know, REITs are also, also have div dividends regulation where, you know, by, they are required by law to distribute at least 90% uh, of the income earned from their real estate investment uh, directly to investors uh, through dividend distribution. Uh, in general, these dividends from REITs are not subjected to taxes in Singapore, uh, unlike rental income from physical properties. Uh, but so you have these friendly taxation rules, uh, steady dividend income and long-term, you know, capital appreciation has allowed you know, REITs to deliver competitive total return historically, as shown in the previous slide. And, and not only that, you know, they're comparatively low correlation with uh, major asset classes, especially the um, broader equity market is another compelling reason for investors to give you know, key consideration when constructing uh, one's portfolio. Now, usually nowadays, investors have you know, a location of different asset classes and geographical regions in their portfolio, you know, maybe like Asia bonds and Asia equities. And by adding the Asia Pacific REITs into the mix, uh, you know, it, it will make a good investment too to mitigate the whole uh, portfolio risk as well. And I think one of the biggest concerns which might be on uh, everyone's mind uh, today is that the rise in the interest rate. Now, would it affect the REITs market? Um, REITs is typically priced for its use and as a defensive you know, asset class, uh, it will potentially become less attractive when interest rate rise. Uh, however, of course, you know, this doesn't mean that you know, investors should avoid uh, investing in REITs in the rising interest rate um, environment. Uh, in reality, I think rising interest rates are typically an indicator of uh, improving economy, uh, which is generally favorable to overall real estate sector. Now, it allows them to, you know, grow occupancy rates, uh, build new properties and hike rents. And this actually helped to improve revenue and cash flow for uh, REITs. And of course, the positive impact of a strong economy actually outweighs the negative repercussion of uh, higher interest rates in most cases. Uh, while we do expect interest rate, you know, to rise as global central banks start to taper, the good news is I think uh, we are kind of in entering a sweet spot where, you know, we have forecasted to see um, gradual rises in the interest rate but not too much and as long as you know the interest rates move in a gradual manner i think right uh, rates are actually poised to enjoy you know optimum benefits uh, of an inflationary uh, environment through uh, both uh, rental growth and capital uh, appreciation so from an investment standpoint uh, opportunities definitely do exist to leverage on the uh, rising interest rate and overall, I think uh, if you look, the, the current macro environment still remain conducive uh, for REITs. And, and from a valuation standpoint, I think APEC REITs is uh, still decent and valuation on the yield spread basis is uh, not really at an overstretched level. Now, the, um, the, <clears throat> the yield spread over the 10 years government bond um, is at about, I think, uh, one point here, at one point, the mean is at about 2.69. Now this is slightly, uh, yeah, this is actually around the mean level. And the current trend that we are seeing is similar to the ones that we have seen in the past cycles. Now we expect the yield spread trends to uh, narrow further with room for uh, capital uh, appreciation. Now the hunt for yields will continue as uh, we are still generally in a low interest environment. So currently, I think APEC REITs are generating about 4 to 5% uh, yields on average, and the dividends are actually expected to, you know, grow at a robust pace of about 5.2% per annum. The, of course, the fallout of, you know, COVID-19 crisis has also created turmoil in the financial markets, and, and REITs were not actually spared either during the COVID period, and, and tenants were actually bad were hit badly by the restrictions and, and other preventive measures to, to combat the health crisis. And the acquisition, you know, appetite at the time waned as REITs operators, you know, seek to uh, conserve cash. However, I think, you know, we, what we have been seeing around the, the globally with effective rollout of vaccination program, uh, programs and the removal of restriction, the reopening team, with the reopening team, we are seeing a growing business confidence. So um, as the post-COVID situation progressively recover to some level of normality, uh, we have seen an uptick in m and activities in the uh, major APEC market, and this trend is likely to grow. And of course, you know, as 
countries start reopening their borders and emerge from pandemic, we will gradually see a recovery in tr uh, uh, trade, travel, and tourism, uh, which in, in turn, in return, you know, will result in a strong growth aspect uh, prospect for APEC REITs. Yeah. And of course, the pandemic, you know, though devastating, also may have well been, you know, uh, uh, proved timely as a wake up call for all of us, uh, for especially for e environmental and social responsibility. Now, I've mentioned sustainability has definitely become the mainstream now. Uh, governments, you know, are catalyzing the adoption of uh, sustainable practices, and major corporates throughout the world are reassessing their business strategies to meet their sustainable, uh, sustainably targets as well as goals. You know, and the world is waking up to the investment opportunity that uh, this brings. So, in a recent survey on the sustainable real estate you know done by another global commercial real estate company uh jll they actually found that you know sustainability is the third consideration uh for occupiers and a seven out of tens are you know now willing to pay a rental premium to lease green buildings in the future uh, and the adoption of net zero carbon is also set uh, is also set to double in uh, Asia Pacific region by 2025, and uh, and thirdly, the 72% of uh, investors believe that you know green certification of buildings drive higher occupancy, higher rents, uh, higher tenant retention, and overall higher value to the asset. Now, in many ways, ESG is of course you know not a new concept for REITs, but it has of course. Uh, become increasingly important in the recent year. And what we observe is that, you know, REITs nowadays have doubled their focus on ESG issues, uh, such as, you know, improving uh, energy and water efficiency for of their building operations, uh, reducing their operational uh, carbon footprints, obtaining green certification, you know, improving tenant uh, satisfaction scores, employee turnover, and the list actually goes on. But, and so if you if you've come to realize that both sustainable or green reads are made out of more than just green building itself, but there's no doubt, right, that buildings are still the centerpiece of uh, what makes a REIT. So what are green buildings? So green buildings actually reduce or eliminate, you know, like negative impacts on the environment and the climate. Um, the definitions of green building vary across, uh, but they can be tied to carbon and energy objectives such as uh, net zero emissions and consideration for the occupant's health and our well-being. So as you can see from here, uh, based on the IFC report, uh, green buildings are not just a low risk asset, but are able to provide higher value too. Now, they definitely offers a number of economic or financial benefit, uh, ranging from, of course, savings of additional costs, a reduction in operational costs, higher rental income, and uh, many more, right? And, and one thing that um, you, you, we should also note that is you know, buildings and construction account for 39% uh, percent of the global CO2 emission. And to make things worse, uh, global building stocks is also expected to double in area by 2060. Now that's going to cause an increase in the carbon emission uh, that is occurring right now. Now there has been an increase in pressure for real estate to be green and that is creating a, a, a USD, you know, 17.8 trillion uh, investment opportunity in green uh, buildings by 2030 in the Asia Pacific region. Now it is the highest uh, among the rest of the um, geographical areas. So I guess, you know, with all these compelling reasons, such as the attractiveness of APEC REITs and the opportunity uh, in the growth of a sustainable Asia Pacific, uh, we actually uh, see an opportunity in this. And, and, and we actually ha have this uh, UOB APEC Green REIT ETF. Um, that's because we acknowledge the need of green REITs and it is definitely crucial for Asia Pacific, right? So just a brief uh, touch on is that this ETF uh, tracks the IH UOB APEC Yield Focused Green Read Index. And the index is actually comprised of a basket of 50 REITs, uh, which deliver high dividend yield to investors by uh, investing in, of course, Asia Pacific, including Japan, and are uh, focused on green REITs, uh, which are identified by a high ESG quality. Now, the ESG quality is actually based on Gresby uh, Real Estate Assessment. So, 
who is Graspi and what is Graspi, right? So Graspi is actually a mission-driven and investor-led organization. They actually provide, you know, standardized and validated ESG data to the capital markets. Uh, established in 2009, uh, ES, uh, Graspi, sorry, has become the leading um, ESG benchmark for real estate and infrastructure investment across the world. Now, the index itself is also optimized for improved risk-adjusted performance via tree filtration process. Uh, there's this uh, dividend yield trap, uh, which actually uh, um, dividend yield trap that address, you know, through a momentum factor analysis. So only REITs that meet the liquidity requirement are passed through the filter. Now, this is also to actually avoid investing in poor quality REITs. Uh, thereafter, REITs are also further segregated and ranked based on the uh, market capitalization. I think the most interesting is uh, the last one, which is the green tilting, um, rewarding greener REITs with a higher weightage based on the environmental attributes. Now, the weight of the REITs can either increase, reduce, or remain unchanged at all, at, at each index review date uh, based on how green they are. So, of course, you know, for the purpose of diversification of the index, there's also a maximum weight uh, will be applied on the selected REITs and single country uh, exposure will also be kept uh, to achieve a better risk diversification. Now, I think uh, in a whole nutshell, right, the green tilting actually what it does that we reward greener REITs with a higher weightage uh, in the uh, index uh, constituent. And of course, um, if you look in terms of the uh, performance, um, in, in terms of the um, green read, um, index focus versus the non uh, green reads, I think the performance you know, so far has also been relatively um, quite comparable. Uh, it's not too bad either. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that, oh, when you add in the green factor, it might actually uh, affect the performance. But uh, over here, if you look at into it, uh, if you look at the three years long-term performance, I think it has performed relatively well as well. And if you look into the, um, the APEC Green ETF versus major asset class, uh, I think it have actually proved is um, resiliently on where the uh, market has been uh, for this year as well. Of course, since launch, if you compare it to the other asset classes, like the Asia Pacific equity, as well as the uh, global equities and the, the, the bond market, it has uh, proven his uh, own resiliency. Um, so it is definitely an asset class on an ETF to actually um, to, to, be, to, to be added onto your portfolio for diversification purposes as well. Yeah. And of course, I think, you know, I've talked a lot about the, uh, the profit or the, you know, about the performance, but what about the purpose, you know, like, you know, the thing is that we do actually measure the green impact measurement, we call it. So there are four um, scopes that we measure on. One is the greenhouse gas emission. One is the energy consumption. Uh, you also have your water consumption as well as the green building certification. So I'm just going to put a little bit on the uh, layman term perspective. So I think in terms, if you look in terms of green, uh, greenhouse gas emission, right, the 2% improvement in greenhouse gas emission is equivalent uh, to reducing greenhouse gas emission from 400 homes energy use for one year. The 1% lower on the energy consumption mean uh, fi over 500,000 home electricity usage during an hour is being saved. And of course, you know, an 8% uh, lower of uh, water consumption means that you are saving water, which can fill, you know, at least 37 Olympic size swimming pool. And of course, you have a high percentage of uh, certified green buildings uh, comparing uh, to the non-green tilt, uh, tilted counterparties as well. Yep. So I think uh, with this screening, you know, optimizations and scoring components, we are able to uh, deliver both the profit together with the purpose. And uh, these are the uh, sector location of the, um, of the ETF as well as the uh, country location. Okay, so um, this is the top 10 constituents. Um, as of uh, end April. I'll just go through a little bit uh, of, of, of the constituent, not all of it uh, due to time constraint. Now, I think um, if you look at DEXs, that they, they manage and create high quality work uh, places across the office, uh, industry and retail healthcare sectors. Now, I think one thing that I would like to highlight that is that all the constituents inside the ETF or the index, they, they have a very 
uh, you know, solid sustainability uh, plan as well as they are, they are really working towards it. So for Dexis itself, I think on the sustainability aspect, they are committed to achieving uh, net zero emission by this year itself. And, uh, in, and in May 2020 alone, um, Dexis actually completed one of the Australia's largest car park uh, solar project at Willow Shopping Centre. And uh, now the project actually includes uh, 4,800 solar PV panels that will generate approximately uh, 2,500 megawatts per annum, uh, which is the equivalent to the usage of uh, 370 Queensland house. Post. Uh, you have also Century Group. Uh, in terms of the green aspect, um, they are targeting a net zero emission by 2030 and reducing their energy by 10% year on year. Uh, they also utilize green energy uh, where there are six megawatts of solar continue to you know, generate between 8,000 and 9,000 megawatts of um, electricity per annum. And Muravec and of course an Australian uh, property group with almost 50 years of experience, they are also targeting a net uh, positive carbon by 2030 and they actually review an industry first apartment you know, made uh, using waste materials that has the potential to uh, re um, revolutionize uh, home constructions and at the same time you know, transform a household waste into a valuable resource. So I just briefly kind of touch on that. And of course, um, these, uh, these are the, some of the information of the uh, ETF itself. And with that, I would like to actually kind of uh, summarize uh, my uh, presentation. So uh, what is this? This is the world first APEC green wheat solution. Uh, secondly, why, why should we be you know, uh, investing in it? Because I think, you know, as I've said, you know, you have USD 70.8 trillion uh, of, of investment opportunity. And not only that, you know, sustainable or green needs are definitely uh, not a key emerging trend, but already a major, a major, major mega trend right now. And of course, the objective is to create an opportunity for profit and purpose for all of us, uh, you know, for uh, sustainable, forging a sustainable future for both me and you, as well as also for our younger generation. So I guess with that, I have actually come to the end of my uh, presentation. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Edward, for the cover presentation. I think uh, I like what you mentioned in your presentation, delivering profit with a purpose. Yes. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, without further ado, I think we have come to the Q&A session. Uh, may I now invite Mr. Benjamin Go? Head of Research and Investor Education from SIAS to moderate the Q&A session. Uh, participants, you may input your questions in the Q&A session here. And for our Facebook audience, uh, you can also click on the link in the description box to join. And uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Over to you guys. Thank you very thank much, you. Eugene. Uh, thank you very much, Edward, for the uh, uh, illuminating presentation on this uh, ETF. Uh, certainly, um, I guess, uh, you know, because of climate change and the focus on ESG factors, uh, certainly this is a very timely product for the Singapore market. All right, um, all right. We currently do not have any questions right now. Maybe I can just kick off with one. Um, perhaps something about the uh, distribution policy. So the based on the uh, construction of the ETF, the index uh, aims for quarterly distributions up to 4% per annum, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but what is what has been the actual um, dividend payout since inception, actually? You mean uh, in terms of the portfolio yield, is it? Um, when you talk about yield, that's total return, isn't it? capital gain plus dividend. Um, yeah, so, okay. As in like uh, for the performance, right? I think, uh, you know, uh, the performance of the, the, the REITs as well has actually taken a bit of an impact uh, from what have, have actually happened in the global markets. Um, of course, one is, you know, um, the geopolitical risk as well. Uh, but I guess that, you know, there's also a resiliency to where the, the ETF has actually dropped to because I, th I guess the reopening team of the, you know, um, the, 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 the across the borders in terms of Asia as well uh, has actually supported some of it. So we are uh, definitely, of course, you know, that, that will actually support the, the REITs performance. But 
one thing to know also note is actually REITs is a medium to long term uh, asset class la. so you probably uh, will have to sit out and as if, as I've shown you before so if you compare uh, you know the the Asia Pacific uh, REITs uh, compared to the Asia Pacific equity market over the long term it actually outperform so uh, definitely there's going to be a volatility on the on the uh, impacting the um, REITs market uh, but I guess over the long term um, we know you will see we will still see out for months and one thing to also add is that you know the esg factor is going to be uh, a main thing as well you know a lot of the reads are going green as well because of the tenants as you know the tenants are coming in and saying that hey you know i am a green green um company right i do a lot of sustainability but the place that i want to hire must also share the same value as me and let's say if your building is not green um, you know what's going to happen is that these companies might not come and rent for you they like i've like in the surveys that you know uh there was actually mentioned the clients are actually willing to pay for that green premium you know so um so that will actually uh enhance the esg um part of the uh, green buildings and the green sectors and that will actually drive uh, of course you know uh profit with purpose yeah so i think in the long term um that has a lot of uh, potential opportunities Mm, sure. I mean, certainly the current market volatility is not helping anybody. Uh, so whether or not you're, uh, um, you know, good stock, bad stock, uh, just going the crosswinds here. Um, so the, I guess a lot of the, um, um, you know, members of uh, CRS as well as people who come to um, this kind of presentations, um, they're kind of the more mature set and a little bit more lower risk level. Mm. Um, so ETF is uh, kind of perceived by the retail investors as a dividend play. Um, your ETF performance here is on an NAV to NAV basis with dividends and distributions reinvested. But if let's say the retail investor were to invest in this particular ETF, uh, what has been the historical dividend yield actually, just the dividend yield? Uh, the historical, I think for the IH, it's on, on the index, it's about 4, 4.5. Okay, but as the index, what about the fund itself? The fund itself, I, uh, I, I mean, historically, because it only launched in November itself. Mm. Yeah. So uh, what I can say is that as of uh, the, um, let me just, just kind of uh, check on the data. Yeah, so as of 31st March, I think the yield is about 4.52. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so the underlying uh, index that uh, so this is a passively managed ETF. Yes, correct. And, yeah, and the underlying index is the IH uh, UOB APAC U Focus Green Read Index. Yep. Um, perhaps for the benefit of um, the people on the call, um, you know, would you be able to kind of uh, talk a little bit about how the index is is uh, put together? I mean, what else? You know, how, how do you actually include or choose the you know stocks that go into this index? Um, is it based on some kind of ESG ranking or is it some kind of proprietary methodology? Okay, okay, great, great. Uh, let me just uh, kind of explain that a little bit more. Uh, so you just give me one moment, yeah? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So just one moment. I'll just explain a little bit in uh, details. So just one moment. Okay, so I guess in, in terms of the whole um, index uh, creation, right? What happened is that the, the index selection process actually involved um, selecting uh, yield focusing reads from all the reads listed in Asia Pacific region. Uh, by having a screen based on liquidity, uh, market capitalization, dividend yield. I have actually briefly mentioned through uh, in, in just now a presentation. Of mm -hmm. course, the um, selected REITs must also meet the minimum disclosure requirement on uh, the ESG factors. So uh, REITs which do not have any Gretzky public score or have a very low uh, Gretzky public score will also be removed from the REITs universe. Now, this exclusion screen uh, serves to, of course, you know, to, to promote the importance of having 
this uh, sustainability disclosure to be considered for inclusion in the index. Now, the index is also, uh, of course, like what I've said, you know, optimized for uh, improved risk adjusted performance via the um, tree uh, filtration uh, process. So the first one is uh, the uh, what we call the dividend yield trap, right? So the dividend trap avoidance is actually applied when 50 names or the 50 constituents are selected. The, the dividend yield trap integration will, of course, exclude REITs which have announced very promising dividend payout while the stock price performed poorly with regards to uh, do their one-year analyzed total return against the peer group. Now, by adopting this uh, dividend yield trap filtering, uh, investors, uh, of course, you no know, profits are further secure. And then thereafter, REITs are also further segregated and ranked uh, based on their market capitalization. And of course, uh, lastly, right, how we actually choose is, of course, like what I say, adding that green tilting. So the green tilting is basically we want to reward, you know, greener REITs with higher weightage uh, based on their uh, environmental, uh, you know, as, uh, attributes. So once selected, the, the weighting allocation is based on, of course, the Gretzky scores, uh, like I mentioned, the weight of the REITs can actually either increase or reduce or remain unchanged at each index review date or on, on how green they are. Uh, and, and basically, in the nutshell, you know, in a very simple process, we want to reward greener REITs with a higher uh, weightage based on the uh, environmental attributes. Yeah. Mm, okay. All right. Um, so thanks for explaining that. Um, so hopefully they will add a lot more color to, yeah. to the methodology behind that. Correct. Because basically, I think, uh, you know, we, we want it to be ESG. So REITs that are, you know, displaying that, you know, uh, ESG sustainability as well as, you know, with grad speed assessment where, you know, it's actually very important, very reliable data. They actually give the score and then that will actually, you know, um, give us, a, give the REITs a higher weightage that is more green. Yeah. So that actually, uh, it, it, that actually provides the purpose uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the profit as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other question about the index is possibly the country allocation is spread across um, four countries, right? Yeah, so yeah. Japan, Australia, Singapore, and and this is Korea, is it? No, uh, Japan, Hong Kong. Oh, this is Hong Kong. Sorry, I don't recognize the flag. All right. Um, okay. Um, would there be, you know, for example, because of the, you know, inflation fears and all that, um, the, you know, the, the foreign exchange for some of these countries are kind of going in, you know, different directions here. Would there be a, um, I guess, would FX risk be a factor for this kind of uh, investments? I, okay, I think uh, when we put in the, uh, the different country location, right? Our main consideration is for clients, you know, if, if you look at to, uh, Singaporeans' clients, they most most likely they will be more familiar with their home ground as we, right? Sure. Yeah, so uh, one thing is for us is we want actually, and um, you know, we, 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 it's a good diversification tool where clients can, of course, you know, uh, have a exposure to the other uh, Asia Pacific region in terms of the risk because there is also opportunity and a value proposition to it. So this is why you know we actually have the Asia Pacific region exposure as well as also you know in terms of demographically as well as investment opportunity there are huge room for potential as well. So um, of course when you are familiar with the home country, you will always invest in the home country estate. And, and of course, you know, investors are not familiar with the real estate market and, and context for overseas and overseas properties that are, are investing in. So, um, of course, similarly, you know, different countries, specific regulatory standards relating to gearing ratio, tax law will also affect the property and risk performance and distribution uh, payout. So I think risk management quality hence important here. Um, investors, of course, need to be cognizant that, you know, one way or another, given that most uh, Singaporeans REITs, uh, Singapore, not Singapore, Singapore REITs is overseas exposure. Their investments are likely to be, you know, exposed to some part of currency risk and fluctuations as well. So uh, overseas investment and uh, exposure result in, uh, of course, exposure to currency risk and fluctuation. But on the flip side, right, uh, if due to the above risk, I think we deem to exclude our exposure to international 
uh, overseas market or uh, investable universe brings to uh to 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 the rich, and of course diversifying from a single economic exposure, uh, is also good, right? Because you are if you are an S rich only, you will be only ex uh exposed to, uh, you will be have a concentrated risk in in terms of uh, Singapore as well. Yeah. So as a uh, it, with an uh, Asia Pacific uh, exposure, you of course you have a broader Asia market as a growth opportunity as well. Yeah, so I guess um, these are some. The, so in the end of the day, uh, when you look at the long term, the um, the opportunity actually outweighs such uh, risk. Uh, yeah. So okay. it's very important to select quality risk. That's why uh, you have asset managers or issuers like the UB Asset Management, you know, working together with uh, SGFI to actually come up with such thing to, you know, choose the quality names overseas. <laughs> yeah. So you, yeah. we let we we do the hard job for. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. 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 Um, can I ask uh, again with regards to FX risk, right? Are the cash flows hedged? Uh, the reason I'm asking is because the the exposure to Japan and Australia is on a total total basis about seventy seven to seventy eight percent, right? That's quite substantial. Hong Kong dollar is obviously pegged to the um, USD, and you've got Sing, which is about thirteen point seven five percent. So about seventy seven to seventy eight percent of the exposure is to Japanese yen as well as uh, Aussie dollars. So are the returns hatch or the distribution? I. I think for the distribution, I I don't think uh, for the FX risk there is FX risk in, in the ETF itself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, there is a question from a member of the public. I think you have already um answered that. So the question was about the actual analyzed uh, a DPU, and you mentioned yeah. it was north of four uh, percent, right? Four point five two. Four point five percent. March. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um. Um, but just to put that in perspective, the fund's inception was um, November 2021. All right, so it's yes. um, yeah. relatively new ETF. <laughs> it is a new ETF. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if it's, you know, as I mean, it depends. Huh? But uh, OK, I, I guess the next question is, how do you see people uh, investing in this ETF as part of their portfolio? I mean, what kind of investors would be more suitable for this kind of product? Okay, one thing I would say is um, clients who are looking for an exposure to the Asia Pacific region, right? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, like how I mentioned before, most of us are all only familiar with the home ground S REITs, but with, uh, with our ETF, it gives you the exposure into the Asia Pacific and the opportunity that it actually presents. Secondly, is also because the clients who are actually concerned about the world climate change and ESG factors, right? Then they will actually uh, aid in, uh, in, in doing the decision of, you know, I want to do something uh, uh, with my investment. I want it to be green. And this, this actually uh, offers the opportunity for clients who are uh, definitely, you know, tuning towards the, the green aspect as well. Yeah. And of course, I've mentioned, you know, the greening of the Asia Pacific has the opportunity for USD $17.8 trillion. So that is you know, that's an, uh, truly an, uh, you know growth area and opportunity for us to be uh, investing in. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and, and, and also just one more, I, I just want to add is that, you know, uh, given my uh, interactions with a lot of clients, the main reason why they're actually investing in this ETF is basically on the green aspect, the greening of this rich sector so i guess as they are also seeing the opportunities in, in the greening area as well as i guess the behavior and the mindset of uh, investors are also changing you know i think global warming climate change is very prominent to us we are uh, we are already feeling it you know you can feel the heat wave from the past few weeks is really uh, quite yeah. bad and you know, it's really hot so i guess you know people are also waking up to it and of course with the whole pandemic you know um, uh, accelerating these ESG factors is also one big factor and of course another thing is you know like top-down approach as well the government the institutions they are talking a lot about ESG and all this so I guess that also changed the mind of the investors as well yeah mm. okay um, I guess we have two minutes left maybe one more question and then we can uh, we can close for the evening yeah. um, 
there is uh, okay. Um, I'm just quickly looking through the deck. Um, what is the current AUM of this uh, this ETF? The current AUM of this ETF is uh, is seeing about seventy nine million. Seventy nine million. Well, that's very impressive considering it's only been six months, five or six months, right? Yes, correct, correct, correct. Yeah. So we we of course expect it to grow with where ESG trends are. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, but out of the 79 million, 50 million is based on C capital from UOB Bank, group. right? Yeah, correct. UOB group. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's all the time that we have for us. So, Edward, thank you very much for joining us this Thanks, evening man. and, of course, for answering questions. Um, so, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for insightful sharing tonight. Uh, we have come to the end of the session. And uh, in case you've missed any part of today's session, you can rewatch the webinar at SIA's YouTube channel. Corporate Connect is a bi-monthly webinar. Do visit our website to get updates on our upcoming investor education program and initiative. The upcoming Corporate Connect will be featuring uh, SASIS uh, read on the 14th of June. Thank you and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you very much.